that night, basically because my heart rate was so low, every time I went to sleep, my heart shut down basically. So I'd wake up to being restarted. Eating disorders affect everybody, people of all ages, coming from all backgrounds and all genders. Everything that my illness lied to me about, the total opposite has become the truth. The moment I spoke about what was going on in my head was the moment that my recovery started. Growing up, I'd always had, not issues with my weight, but I was always on the chunkier side. I was getting to that age of 15 where puberty hits. You start thinking about girlfriends. You want to start going on, uh, going to the gym, getting muscles. What then made me think, right, I want to lose weight now. And it was only till the weight loss started was where my relationship with food changed. It kind of became so obsessive. I'd walk around supermarkets and study labels for hours, like four hours a time. It suddenly became an unhealthy relationship. I began to start wearing baggy clothes, layering up, putting holes in my belt so that I could tighten it. It got to a point where my parents started thinking, right, there's something not right here. Ben's removing himself to his bedroom for hours on end. And I think just because of the worry, my dad was like, right, we're going to go and see a paediatrician. Went to the clinic and he was like, oh, if you just take your top off for me, I just need to put some pads on your chest to check your pulse and stuff. And as soon as I took my top off, he was like, right, I don't need to go any further. And he just basically said to my dad, like, Ben's a human skeleton. He needs to be seen by a mental health team because I believe he's got anorexia. And I was like, I've not got anorexia. There's not a chance that I've got anorexia. Anorexia is something that girls get, and not something that a, a, a boy would get. At 16, I was 41 kilos, seen by a mental health nurse. My pulse read like 16 beats per minute, and just the face was just like, like, like she'd never seen anything like it before. And she was like, you're on the borderline of having a heart attack. And then that night, Basically, because my heart rate was so low, every time I went to sleep, my heart shut down, basically. So I'd wake up to being restarted. So yeah, it was cardiac arrest. So I was still dangerously low weight. It was like, next step is, you can either go home uh, and be seen as, a, as an outpatient at the, at the local CAMS team, or you can go to an inpatient unit. I'd seen so many people cry about me and I thought, right, I'm gonna to go to the inpatient unit. And it was scary, you know. <laughs> on the day I went to the unit, I picked my GCSE results up in the morning and, and then obviously after that, I was going straight to a mental health unit. And, and again, that was just a surreal experience going in there. The first three months in there was kind of a doddle. I could go to the toilet without being supervised and things like that. So then the behaviors that I had Prior to going into hospital at all, I could kind of bring in, so I was going to the toilet, doing a thousand press-ups, doing a thousand sit-ups, walking on the spot for 20 minutes, and then it got to about three months down the line, and I'll never forget it, the staff brought me into this meeting, and I thought, oh, look, something not right. The team which were around my care, we were all there, and they were like, right then, we know what you've been doing, you're losing weight. For now, you're gonna be put on one-to-one -one observations, so basically a staff member would follow me around for 24 hours a day, even coming to the toilet. I kind of hit this wall then because again, all the control was taken off me and, and kind of the illness had full control over me now. I thought that by killing myself that it would take all these demons out of my life. Next thing I just remember waking up, like waking up with all these staff around me. I would say for the three months after that was was pretty, it was like hell. Every opportunity I got, I tried to hurt myself. It got to a point where, I was, you know, I was in seclusion, which is a bare room. And I had this sit down and chat not long after that. And the last attempt to try to save my life with um, a support worker and I got on with him. And he just basically sat down and said to me, like, it was quite brutal really. He said, you've got ligature marks around your neck, you've got cuts on your arms, you've got a hole in your arm. He said, you started on this journey to look good for the girls. No girl would come anywhere near you with the way you look at the moment. 
and everything your illness is telling you has brought you to be in this situation, which is nothing, nothing to do with happiness. And something clicked then, and don't get me wrong, I didn't wake up the day after and just start eating everything. And I was so happy to gain weight and things like that. But it kind of installed like almost what I call a light at the end of the tunnel. Gradually increased what I was eating. And I gradually gained weight, steady weight. And it wasn't easy, it was hard. Um, a lot of tears and a lot more punching walls and things like that. But in that period of time, I'd managed to get to a healthy weight and something then stopped me from carrying on. And I think it was the resilience and the strength that I'd built in that year and everything that kind of me, my family, the staff had been through. And I remember the day I just picked up the phone to my dad uh, and I just said, Dad, I, I need your help, I wanna get better. And that was the first time that I'd ever, ever stood up to the illness and said, I want to get better. I, I don't want you in my life anymore. Back in 2018, I was told that I was going to be part of a big storyline where Cleo starts with an eating disorder and she starts suffering with bulimia. You didn't faint, Cleo. You had a heart attack cardiac arrest on a wedding day, you know, you can you could think when you first read that on the page, it's like, oh, that's a bit soap and unrealistic. And is that a bit extreme? No, that's how dangerous and how serious it can get if your body is, you know, starved of the fuel it needs to survive. We have a massive responsibility to get it right, especially with something like an eating disorder. It's about what's going on in somebody's, you know, in somebody's mind. Um, and obviously mental health is such a huge topic that we love to tackle at Hollyoaks. So yeah, I just love being a part of these storylines. I'm grateful that they help people. So how come we're here? So this is Rivington. Rivington's like quite sentimental to me. I used to, the dog that I got when I was ill, I got a dog in the unit, Freddie, and we used to come up here. It's just somewhere that, for me, I found that I could clear my head. And we used to go to the top of the pipe when there's no one out there and I'd just shout and scream at the top. Really? Freddie wow. just used to sit there watching me oh, and not say anything, not judge us. Oh my God, I'd, that so, sounds like such a release. It means something it means to me coming up here, yeah, so I thought it'd be nice. How did you find lockdown? Because yeah. I don't know about you, but our day revolved around food. Yeah. You know, like, wait, what are we having for lunch? Yeah. And on Instagram, you'd go on, everyone's making banana bread. Yeah. And how, how did you, did it trigger anything from yeah. the past? Or I think how did you find that? Lockdown highlighted to me that I'm probably not as far down recovery as I thought I was before lockdown. I was able to highlight what I was struggling with and put things in place to build on that. So now I would say I'm stronger now than I was before COVID because okay. I've kind of been through, not, not, not just me, everybody has, but been through the rough and come out, identified where I need to work on and worked yeah. on it and built on it better. How do you deal with them, um, with it? day to day now because like you said yeah. you said it's ne it never really fully leaves you you no. always have that little voice somewhere yeah. anorexia always controlled me in the past whereas i control anorexia now so it's something that i don't think will ever go away but it's something that won't let control my life yeah and you know i'm not gonna lie i have a bad day every now and again but a bad day a bad day back 10 years ago was not eating all day going out doing a 20k run you know and exercising and making myself you know just burn calories, yeah. whereas today, if I wake up in a bit of a, a rubbish mood, I just say, right, go down, get breakfast, go to the gym, go to work, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I just put thing, coping strategies in place where I know that it won't allow the illness to creep back in. That was my biggest question that I wanted to ask. What is the right thing to say to a friend if they're struggling? I know it's, personally, like everybody's different. I like, I like people being brutal with me. If you say nothing, then that's the worst thing that can happen. But at the same time, you've got to kind of approach it with a, a bit of empathy yeah, and kind of say, listen, like, I don't understand what's going on, but help me understand. You're not on your own. I want to help you as much as we can. We don't want this illness taking our friend away from no. us. We want, you know, we want them back and we want to help. It's like an addiction. That's yeah. the best way I can put it. You have to have your fix of 
whatever you're addicted to. I had to have my fix of every week I had to lose weight. If I didn't lose weight, then that wasn't good enough. But at the same time, you've got to take the positives from it and think, if I can get through this, I can get through anything. Yeah, it makes you a bit nothing, like something unbreakable. Nothing scares me, no. no. It's not impossible, and it's possible, and, you know, it does take some... Day it, might, day. it doesn't matter how long it takes, as long as it happens, that's all that matters. Yeah, you get there in the yeah, end. Yeah, you do. Yeah. You do. It was so good to see Ben again, and he just looks so well and healthy, and it seems like he's in a really good place. He's an advocate and a voice that it can affect anyone and it affects men as well. Um, so yeah, I just I hugely respect him and yeah, it's, he's just such a nice lad. It was great chatting to him. You've got to speak about it. The moment I spoke about what was going on in my head was the moment that my recovery started because things started getting put in place. So you might be in a position where you don't want that control taken off you but that control being taken off you is what's going to save your life and what's going to help you get your old life back. If you've been affected by or would like some more information on the issues raised in this episode, then please visit channel4.com support. <laughs>